Hi, thanks for watching the first episode of The Science of Getting High, a show where I'm gonna talk about the science of getting high. I named it well. I'm Dr. Falco, I'm not a real doctor, but I do have a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry, and I also look like this, which if you're listening to the audio version of this, just picture some combination of Sideshow Bob and the bad guy from Home Alone. That's what I look like. One time I was going to a grocery store in a small town in New Zealand, a guy driving a car pulled up next to me and just asked me if I wanted to buy some LSD. So I have a look that says, this is a person who knows a thing or two about drugs, I guess. So I figured I should make a show where I talk about drugs. I'm not just gonna talk about drugs on the show though, I'm also gonna talk about anything that gets you high. When I say getting high, I mean anything that improves your mood, releases chemicals in the brain that make you feel good. So exercise, falling in love, accomplishing a life goal, stuff like that. But the first episode, I am gonna talk about drugs because you're probably listening to a show called The Science of Getting High because you wanna learn a thing or two about drugs. So this episode, I am going to tell you if you have your mind made up, you wanna take a drug, what the safest drug to take is using scientific evidence. Now, obviously the safest drug to take would be no drug. The best thing you could do is go for a run, make a painting, write a song, something that just makes you feel good naturally. But unfortunately, not everyone is gonna do that. Humans have been taking drugs for almost their whole history. 70% of people in America last year drank alcohol. Alcohol is a drug that gets you high. It's not going away. So it's also gonna be useful to try and talk about drug harmfulness just from a scientific perspective and figure out which one actually is the safest. So to figure out which drug was safest, I did every single drug in the world, wrote down some notes, and no, I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. I'm not just gonna rely on my opinion because although I think my opinion is pretty awesome, it's not gonna be the most scientifically accurate. So I went into the peer-reviewed scientific literature and I looked up some research studies where they had experts determine which drugs were more harmful based on a panel of experts looking at a bunch of different criteria of drug harmfulness. And I'm gonna use that to tell you guys which drug is the safest. Peer reviewed research is pretty much the best source of information in general because peer review is where a bunch of other scientists look at the work of a scientific group, find out all of the things that are wrong with it. They send it back to the original scientists. They fix everything, write it up again, send it back then they'll probably reject it again, they send it back again, then it might get approved, and we get pretty good verifiable evidence to make scientific claims. So that is what I'm using as evidence to determine what the safest drug is. And the main group that I'm using research from is from a group led by a guy named Professor David Nutt, which is an amazing name for a researcher. And he got together 20 to 30 different experts in three different areas in the UK, in the European Union, and in Australia. And he had these experts rank drugs on a scale of zero to 100 based on how harmful they are to society and to individual people. Now they didn't look at every single drug out there because that would be really hard, basically impossible. So they looked at 20 of the most common abused drugs like alcohol, heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, LSD, MDMA, ketamine. Also, they looked at some prescription drugs like benzodiazepines and Valium and compared how harmful they were. And the results are that they found that alcohol was actually the most harmful drug in the EU, the UK, and Australia when they looked at harm to society and harm to users. And they found that psilocybin in magic mushrooms was the least harmful drug. And this is pretty surprising and one important thing to consider is that alcohol is legal and psilocybin is illegal. So it's likely that if psilocybin was legal, a lot more people would take it and we would see a bigger harm to society and individual people. However, it is unlikely that it would be close to as harmful as alcohol. And I'll go through some of these papers to show you why. Now, when I go through this research, it's gonna get pretty boring because scientists are not good writers. We're not very charismatic or captivating, and we didn't major in literature. There's spelling mistakes in them even that I'll point out, which is fun. But if you want to learn more, there's good information in there, and if you pay attention, I think you will be glad you did at the end. So let's go into the research if you want to learn more. All right, now let's get into the peer-reviewed research. Now, I'm going to do another video on how to access peer-reviewed papers for free. So if you want to find any of these, some of these are free to download. 
some you need a subscription, but I'll make a video on how to access any peer-reviewed research article for free because I think research should be free and available to the public. All right, so the first paper I'll look at is called Drug Harms in the UK, a multi-criteria decision analysis just rolls off the tongue. And this is the paper put together by Professor David Nutt, and he was part of the UK Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. So he sort of put this study together to try and figure out how harmful drugs were to figure out how they should be legislated. So ideally drugs that are more harmful should carry harsher punishments. So that was kind of why he did this. And he used multi-criteria decision analysis because this is a tool that had been used to try and figure out complex problems like um, how to deal with nuclear waste in different countries. So multi-criteria decision analysis is a tool where a bunch of experts come together to try and figure out how to solve a complex problem. So in the case of ranking drugs, it involves, and I'm going to skip to a different paper here because the one in the UK doesn't show us what the experts were experts in, but they used the same type of experts for each of these different studies. So I mentioned earlier that they did this study in the UK, the EU, and in Australia. So in Australia, they tell you what each of the people were doing. So we've got specialists in addiction medicine, psychiatry, policy and research, emergency medicine, a toxicologist. So I actually teach pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Otago in New Zealand. So toxicologists study how toxic drugs are and their toxic effects. So this guy is going to be pretty useful for the study. My name is also Jonathan. How about that? We've also got someone in the police force. So kind of got a pretty diverse selection of people to help figure out how harmful different drugs are. So to rate the harmfulness of drugs, they looked at a bunch of different aspects of drug harm. So they looked at harm to individual users. So that included things like drug-specific mortality, so how often do people die from the drug, drug-specific damage, dependence, how likely is a drug to make you addicted to it. They also looked at social effects to individuals, so loss of relationships, and then they also looked at harm to society. So this included things like injury, so maybe how drunk driving can impact people, crime, environmental damage, economic costs, and influence to the community. Now when they added up all of these effects, they found that alcohol was the most harmful drug overall. And the ratings go, so the alcohol was the most harmful when looking at harm to society and harm to individual users combined. Heroin was next, followed by crack cocaine and methamphetamine. And a fun thing to point out, they actually misspelled methamphetamine in this study, which is pretty amazing. This is published in a journal called The Lancet, which is the second highest impact factor journal in the world, which means it's the second most prestigious, so is literally one of the best, and they actually misspelled it. M-E-T-A-M-F-E-T-A-M-I-N-E. So give it up for the peer review process. And if we go all the way to the other end of the scale, the least harmful drugs were mushrooms being the least harmful, or psilocybin is the active component in mushrooms, buprenorphine, and then LSD, followed by ecstasy. And David Nutt actually got fired from his position in the UK regulating drugs because he had a quote from this research where he said that taking ecstasy was less harmful than riding a horse, which was accurate based on the study, but uh, the media and the government didn't like that, so he ended up getting fired, which was sad. Now, an interesting thing that I'll point out here is that buprenorphine is very low on the list, even though it binds to the same receptor that heroin does. And I'll just briefly talk about what a receptor is. Wow, that was a lot of boring scientific reading. This is a good time to take a break and explain what a receptor is. Now, a receptor is one of the two main components that allows our brains to operate. Now, we have 100 billion neurons inside of our heads, and the way that these neurons make thoughts is they talk to each other. And the way they talk to each other is they release chemicals called neurotransmitters, which bind to things called receptors. So 
neurotransmitters are kind of like my finger and the receptor is like my hand. So the neurotransmitter goes into the receptor and it stimulates the neuron and activates it. And that is actually how a thought happens. So the way drugs work is that they take the place of the neurotransmitter or the finger. So they bind the receptor and activate it to stimulate the neuron. So heroin and buprenorphine both bind to opioid receptors, which are found in the limbic system in the brain, among other places. And this is an area of the brain that makes us feel really, really good. So natural opioids get released during exercise and running. It's what gives us the runner's high. So drugs that hijack the opioid system tend to be highly addictive. But the difference between heroin and buprenorphine is that heroin binds this receptor very well and buprenorphine does not bind it well. So heroin basically elicits a very strong response to the opioid receptor and buprenorphine does not. So heroin is very harmful where buprenorphine is not. Just an example of how drugs that bind to the same receptor can actually have big differences in drug harm. Now, if we look at the European rating of drug harms, we are basically doing the same thing that we did before, but we are just doing it in Europe instead of the UK. Now this time, they got closer to spelling methamphetamine right, but they still spelled it wrong. So this time, they changed the F out for a PH, so they got a little bit closer, but they still left out the H in the meth part. So um, science is improving, so that's good. But in general, it looks, uh, it looks pretty similar. So alcohol is still number one, heroin is number two, crack is number three. And then once again, at the very bottom, we have LSD, buprenorphine, and magic mushrooms, or psilocybin. And that's a good thing for this study because it's fairly subjective, although these people are experts in different areas. It's a bunch of humans getting together to try and make decisions. So if they can agree in different areas, if different experts in different areas can agree, then I think that lends more support to the evidence in this study. And another thing I'll mention about alcohol is that if we just look at harm to the user, alcohol is actually less harmful than heroin and crack. So a lot of alcohol's harm comes in its harm to society. And part of that could be the legality because more people use it. So it is it just has a higher impact. So if heroin was legal and a lot of people used it, it's quite possible that it would have a greater harm to society and users than alcohol. But I don't think it's too likely that heroin will be um, available at bars and at supermarkets anytime soon, but you never know. All right, now on to the Australian harm study. Now, I mentioned that uh, this one was nice because they listed all of our experts here. So if you're interested in all of the different people involved in this study, you could look at that page. Now, this time, they actually gave up on typing out the word methamphetamine. They just called it crystal meth. And they actually did manage to uh, get the H in, so they spelled it M-E-T-H. So uh, give it up to the research group for finally spelling meth right on the third attempt. And another thing that they did that I thought was really good was they included prevalence in their study. So this text is small and might be hard to read, but I just want to try and keep this on the same page for a minute. Now, they included the prevalence of alcohol at 17%. So this was, so their definition for alcohol prevalence here was people who had more than two standard drinks per day. So moderate to heavy drinkers were what they considered. So 17% of people in Australia fell under that category. And in Australia, they found that crystal meth was actually more harmful than heroin. And this is a good example of how prevalence can affect the drug harm. So crystal meth was much more prevalent in Australia than heroin because meth can be made in Australia, whereas heroin has to be imported. And in the EU, we found heroin was much more harmful than crystal meth. And it turns out people in the EU use heroin more often than they use crystal meth. So we can see that a higher drug prevalence can also increase drug harm. However, if we look at LSD and mushrooms, we see a fairly high prevalence at 1%. So this is comparable to benzodiazepines, uh, prescription drugs that often get abused. It's not too far off from cocaine or prescription opioids. 
So our prevalence here means that we wouldn't see that much higher harm with LSD and mushrooms if they were legal or used more regularly. And if we look at ecstasy at 2.2%, we've got a very comparable level to cocaine, which is much higher on the harm scale. So we see cocaine more in the middle, where ecstasy is still far at the bottom. And this time they just combined LSD and mushrooms together because they bind to the same receptor, the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. And they also included electronic nicotine devices. And an important thing to think about there is that we don't fully know what the long-term effects are of electronic nicotine devices or vaping. So it's possible that as we find out more about these, there could be more harm. They also included kava, which is a common psychoactive root used in the Pacific Islands. And this one has the lowest harm of all, but it's not really a commonly used drug in the world, so I didn't, I didn't include it in my overall ranking of things. Another interesting thing to consider is that cannabis shows a moderate level of harm. So cannabis is kind of more in the middle for a lot of these studies. So a lot of times um, people that tend to be scientific think that cannabis is pretty harmless, but we actually do see some level of harm in these studies with cannabis use. So it's likely, while it should probably be legalized, it is not a harmless drug. And one more thing I'll say is that caffeine was not included in these studies. So caffeine would probably be less harmful than all of these, similar to kava, but caffeine isn't really abused. So when I talk about comparing drug harm, I really wanted to focus on drugs that people take to potentially abuse. So that was kind of the purpose of this episode. Now, we don't really know what the long-term effects of LSD and psilocybin are. And it's difficult to find that out because there aren't that many people that use it all the time. But there is a psychoactive psychedelic drug that is used all the time by people, and that is something called ayahuasca. Now this drug is used in the Amazon region of Brazil and Peru, and it's not a perfect example of trying to figure out how psilocybin and LSD would work long term because ayahuasca combines two drugs in one drink. So it combines something called the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And this is a type of drug that's actually used as a very strong antidepressant. And it also combines a drug called dimethyltryptamine. And this is the psychedelic drug in ayahuasca. And it binds to the 5-HT2A receptor, just like psilocybin and LSD. So DMT makes a good comparison for these drugs. Now, ayahuasca is a great thing to compare because people use this throughout their entire lives in these regions. So we can actually look at people taking a psychedelic drug for a really long period of time and see what the long-term effects are. So in this study, they looked at people who took ayahuasca for a minimum of 15 years with a frequency of at least twice a month. So these are people who took ayahuasca a ton of times. So this will give us a good sample to see what would happen if people took a psychedelic drug for a really long period of time on a semi-frequent basis. Now they had two groups for the study. They had indigenous people in the jungle who took ayahuasca, and then they also had people in urban settings who sort of jumped on the ayahuasca hype train because it sounded cool and, I don't know, they felt like it. So. We're comparing people using ayahuasca in the jungle to people not using ayahuasca in the jungle and then people using ayahuasca in urban settings to people not using ayahuasca in urban settings. So we have, a, we have two different control groups and two different people taking ayahuasca. So they looked at a lot of different things in the study. They looked at a lot of different psychological disorders. They looked at general cognition, so brain function in general. And some of the studies they looked at included looking at tests to measure obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, anxiety, and psychoticism. So likelihood of developing psychosis or psychotic symptoms. And they found that there actually was not an increase in psychological disorders with the use of ayahuasca. So they actually found significantly lower levels of depression, anxiety, and psychosis in the people who used ayahuasca over the control group. 
So that seems pretty surprising to me that we actually see significantly lower instances of psychological disorders with ayahuasca over the control group. Now, one important thing to consider here is that people taking ayahuasca for a very long period of time likely don't have a risk of developing psychosis. So anyone who has psychosis and has a negative response to ayahuasca isn't going to keep taking it for 15 years. So there's potentially a bias here where anyone who has a negative reaction to ayahuasca will just stop taking it. So anyone taking it for a long period of time tolerates it well and might have a very low risk of mental illness in the first place. But one thing that is important here is that it shows that if you take ayahuasca for 15 years and you're normal, it doesn't cause psychosis. Now we'll go over some of the cognitive effects of ayahuasca. So they had people take a bunch of different tests to measure cognition or how well your brain works with people taking ayahuasca long-term and a control group. So some of these cognitive tests evaluate something called cognitive interference. So this is what the Stroop test measures. And the Stroop test is where you are given a list of colors written out like this, and there's a font in a different color than the color of the word that's written. So here we have the word yellow with red font. So you're supposed to say the word yellow, but the red font tricks your brain. So it's how fast you can kind of deal with competing information. And we see that people who took ayahuasca long-term scored significantly better than the control samples. Now, one important thing to consider here is that the control group and the ayahuasca group were not matched in IQ, so it's possible that the ayahuasca sample just happened to deal better with these tasks than the control group, although they were matched with education, so at least this wasn't due to a difference in education. All right, so now we'll go over one more ayahuasca study, and this one is not quite as powerful as the last study because we just don't have the same numbers of people using, and they didn't use ayahuasca for the same time period. So this study looked at 22 ayahuasca users and 22 controls, and these people only used ayahuasca at least 50 times in the previous two years. So they haven't used ayahuasca quite as long as the other group, and we also have fewer people in the study. So it may not be as powerful for those two reasons. Now, one very interesting thing with this study is that they actually measured how brain structure changed in the ayahuasca group, and they actually found different volumes of brain matter in specific areas of the brain, which is pretty crazy. So they used structural MRI to basically measure brain volume in certain areas, and they found in people who used ayahuasca, they had significantly less cortical thickness in an area of the brain called the posterior cingulate cortex, and they had significantly higher cortical thickness in an area of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. So if you look at these images over here in blue, this is a decrease in cortical thickness in the PCC, posterior cingulate cortex, and in red we have an increase in cortical thickness in the ACC. Now this is interesting because during LSD and psilocybin use, we see lower PCC activity. And the PCC is largely responsible for maintaining a network in the brain called the default mode network, which is active when your mind is just wandering or daydreaming or remembering memories. And it's thought that the PCC is very important in maintaining your sense of self. So some people studying psychedelics have found that when people lose their sense of self and experience oneness with the universe or things around them, the floor, whatever it might be, they see decreased PCC activity and the extent to which they feel a sense of oneness can be matched by the lack of PCC activity. So this provides evidence that long-term use of ayahuasca may decrease that PCC activity, and that decreased PCC activity might actually reduce the cortical thickness in the PCC. Now, the PCC has also been implicated in depression, and people who have overactive PCCs may have excessive rumination that can lead to negative 
psychological states. So I'll go over this a lot more when I talk about psychedelics, but it's possible that having lower PCC cortical thickness might actually be helpful for an improved mood, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Now, thickening of the ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex may be responsible for the increased cognitive effects that we see in some of those tests from our other study. And this group also repeated some of those cognitive tests and found similar results. So if we look at some of the cognitive tests, we see some significant improvement in our ayahuasca group. So we see fewer misses with this cognitive test by a significant margin, and significance is defined as a p-value less than 0.05, so 0.013 is less than 0.05. And we also did not see increased psychopathological symptoms similar to the previous ayahuasca study. Now they also looked at how long people took ayahuasca for and saw a correlation with how long people took ayahuasca for and the size of the PCC. So we see that the longer people took ayahuasca, the smaller and smaller the volume of the PCC gets. And this did have a significant correlation here. Now we also see a significant correlation between size of the PCC and a personality trait called self-transcendence. So as the PCC shrinks, we see an increase in the self-transcendence personality trait. And self-transcendence can relate to a decrease in attachment to one's own perspectives, as well as an extension of care and compassion and concern to others, and less general self-importance. It can also increase the likelihood of someone being religious and experiencing spirituality. So... It's likely generally a positive trait with perhaps some negative aspects, potentially. Maybe in a capitalist society, being less self-serving means you're going to make less money. But the result of these ayahuasca studies is that the long-term use of ayahuasca did not seem to increase any risk in psychopathology or a decrease in cognition. Now, one more interesting thing about the ACC is that the ACC is involved in attention and cognition, and people who have ADHD have actually been found to have lower volumes of brain matter in the ACC. And it's actually been found that there's a correlation between how small the ACC is and how inattentive people with ADHD can be. So it's possible that this increase in ACC volume in the brain with long-term ayahuasca use is the cause of increased cognition. But in my opinion, we need a lot more studies and evidence to make that claim because the study just wasn't quite that powerful. All right, so finally, I am going to go on to a study looking at mescaline. And this one might be a little bit more relevant in regards to psilocybin and LSD because mescaline still binds to the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor but it's not a combination of two drugs like ayahuasca is, so our effects won't be due to the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. This study is also interesting because it is being compared to, so we're looking at the long-term use of mescaline compared to people who don't take drugs at all, and also people who are former alcoholics. So we're kind of doing a head-to-head -head comparison between mescaline and alcohol. Now, in this study, they were looking at people who ingested mescaline on at least 100 occasions. And in this case, they're taking mescaline as peyote, which is a cactus that grows in Mexico and America. So when we compare our mescaline group to the, and these are former alcoholics, so this is people who have been sober for at least two months, are not drinking anymore. So hopefully some of the cognitive effects of alcohol or long-term alcohol use might have gone away. So they're not currently drunk when they're taking the test, I guess is the important thing to think about here. If we compare people taking peyote to the control group not taking peyote, we see no change in anxiety, depression, loss of behavioral or emotional control. We see an increase in general positive affect. So that's good. We see no change in emotional ties life satisfaction, psychological distress, 
we also see an increase, a significant increase in psychological well-being, and we see no change in the mental health index. We actually see an increase, although it was not a significant increase. Now, if we look at the alcohol group, we see significantly negative effects for all of these. So we see increased anxiety and depression. We see decreased general positive affect. We see decreased emotional ties. We see an increase in psychological distress, a decrease in psychological well-being, and a decrease in the mental health index. So I think this study is good because it shows us we're kind of getting rid of some of that bias we had where psilocybin and LSD are illegal, so they won't be used as much. So in this case, peyote is actually legal because uh, Native Americans are allowed to take peyote as a religious ceremony. So it's actually legal for them. So we're kind of comparing legal drugs to legal drugs here. So it's a fairly powerful study. And if we look at some of the same executive function tests, we see no significant difference with the peyote or mescaline group. So we don't see an improvement in executive function like we did with ayahuasca, but we also don't see a decrease. So that's good. But in the alcohol group, we see a decrease in immediate recall. So we see a decrease, a significant decrease in some executive functions. So this research group summarized the effects of mescaline by saying that the ritual use of peyote did not cause residual psychological or neuropsychological deficits detectable in any of the tests that they administered. And they also added that for the Native American church members who take peyote and serve in the United States armed services, they found no evidence that a history of peyote use would compromise the psychological or cognitive abilities of these individuals. I just think it's kind of funny that America, they felt the need to mention the military and how um, taking mescaline wouldn't make you a worse soldier. Just America's general uh, obsession with the military is funny sometimes. All right, so... I hope this was useful. I hope I gave a pretty objective and scientific look at the use of drugs. I think the conclusion is there's no drug that is 100% safe, but if you are going to take a drug, psilocybin or LSD most likely has less harm than any of the other drugs that I talked about, including alcohol and tobacco that are legal. So, you know, sometimes there isn't a correlation between the law, and what's good for you. And I think this is a good example of that. So hope you enjoyed this episode and see you next time. Bye.